in um, welcoming and introducing uh, Dr. Les Libido from the Open University. Uh, I think his work will probably be well known to, to many of you, and you'll know him either in person or through that war work. So he's at, at the Open University, and he's been studying every food and environmental issues since the 1980s now, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he's co-author of, of two books, is that right? Yeah, co-author of two books, Governing the Transatlantic Conflict Over Agricultural Biotechnology, um, published in 2006, is that right? Yeah. And GM Food on Trial, Testing European Democracy, 2010. And he's also on the core expert, the expert group of technology platform Organics, and is editor of the journal Science as Culture. And of course, he's also the author of many uh, peer-reviewed uh, papers and, and book chapters, including a recent uh, paper with uh, our director, Michel Pambert and Gaetan van Lockeren, uh, Agroecological Research Conforming or Transforming the Dominant Agro-Food Regime. And of course, a recent paper in the Journal of Rural Studies, entitled European Transitions Towards Corporate Environmental Food Regime, Agroecological Incorporation or Contestation. So Les will be picking up on a number of those themes today in a talk entitled Sustainable Intensification, Agroecological Appropriation or Contestation. Right, thanks. Um, this is the first time I'm presenting these ideas, at least in detail. I had a, a brief try of the ideas at the agroecology workshop that we had in Brussels a few weeks ago, but that had a very short time limit for each talk. So here I have the opportunity to draw on your various kinds of expertise and thoughts about um, ideas in more detail. <coughs> So, what does this term mean, sustainable intensification? <clears throat> the concept arose in global south contexts with low agricultural yields. This limited locally grown food and livelihoods unless more land would be taken over for cultivation, thus increasing environmental degradation and greenhouse gas emissions. To avoid this prospect, Sustainable intensification, henceforth SI, meant production methods where yields are increased without adverse environmental impact and without the cultivation of more land. That's a quote from Jules Pretty, 1997. Later, the concept gained a new rationale, especially after the 2007 <coughs> spike in global food prices signaling a longer-term global problem of food insecurity. This was attributed to various causes, climate change, land and water shortages, competition for biomass, growing market demand for biofuels and livestock products, and so on, according to uh, Gordon Conway, among others. These latter causes of the problem, linking production priorities with global markets became politically contentious and they informed diverse views on sustainable intensification. As the productivity problem was extended from the global south, from subsistence farmers there, to global agriculture, the original SI concept was widely taken up or adapted by several institutions, including the FAO and the Royal Society. So according to the FAO, I'll say SI from now on for short, SI allows countries to achieve sustainable increases in agricultural productivity through an ecosystem approach, especially for going beyond subsistence agriculture. For organic agriculture, it means maximizing primary production per unit area without compromising the ability of the system to sustain its productive capacity. To avoid such negative impacts of intensification, these agendas propose various remedies. And from a critical perspective, there's a familiar dominant imperative 
quote, according to the FAO, to rebuild research and technology transfer capacity in developing countries, that is, transfer to those countries and to farmers, in order to provide farmers with appropriate technologies through a rich toolkit of relevant, adoptable, and adaptable ecosystem-based practices, according to the FAO. Next quote, according to the Royal Society, cultivation <coughs> methods should shift to renewable inputs intensive in knowledge, technology, natural capital, and land. The intensity of use of non-renewable inputs must decrease. How? By substituting a range of techniques, including agroecological methods and GM crops, according to the Royal Society. And this shift is linked with globalized, volatile markets. Quote, domestic patterns of food production and consumption have become interconnected in global markets, implying an imperative for global agriculture to adapt to those markets. So in these various ways, SI agendas espouse a toolkit of various options, somehow reconciling the overall aims, including market competitiveness. Now, SI was initially welcomed for recognizing the current and potential contribution from agroecological agri methods, but SI is also suspected of subordinating those methods to a different political economic agenda. So I pose these questions. Oh, here. Just a moment. How do these agendas relate to agroecological methods? What tensions arise around different forms of intensification? How do these roles involve socioeconomic environmental assumptions? And how do these conflicts arise, especially in the EU context? Well, the answers to these questions depend partly on a theory of the dominant system, its drivers, and its potential contestation through agroecology. So I'll present some ideas from literatures about other topics. So in particular, food regime. And this theoretical framework has a history of a couple of de decades, initially from Harriet Friedman. So she defined an agro-food regime as a rule-governed structure of production and consumption of food, since the 1970s, the dominant agro-food regime has become a market-driven system whereby agro-industrial methods maximize yield and generate surpluses, in turn undermining productive capacities and less intensive methods elsewhere. Thus, the regime pushes farms everywhere to adopt intensification methods. What are the prospects for this regime to change? in the face of so much criticism globally. Well, according to her, a recent tendency has been a corporate environmental food regime. This shifts agro-industrial production methods along lines reducing some environmental effects, or environmental harms, while also deepening commodity relations in agriculture and satisfying consumer demand for green products. Such a new regime potentially emerges from capitalizing such alternatives. She says, a new round of accumulation is emerging based on selective appropriation of demands by environmental movements and including issues pressed by various activists. So in this emerging sector, some standards and innovations originate from alternatives being appropriated. But most of these health, environmental, and social problems cannot be reduced to consumer demand for novel products or reduced to better techniques. So this nascent corporate environmental food regime has been contested by the movements which it appropriates. Contradiction. Next concept is uh, neoproductivism. Which has been a way to theorize this policy concept, sustainable intensification. According to Terry Marsden, an incipient neoproductivist paradigm 
faces the challenge to locate the environmental sustainability and resilience of national food supply systems within current globalization patterns. This neoproductivist paradigm has been widely articulated as sustainable intensification. The neoproductivist paradigm has been repositioned in different ways across national political systems, and so it can have different meanings and expressions. Although it does encompass a cooperative version, enhancing farmers' knowledge, the prevalent form is a competitive market-driven productivism, somehow trying to reconcile that with environmental protection, resource conservation, and so on. Now, how does this relate to agroecology? Well, as many people will know from the classic paper by Wetzel and colleagues, agroecology was originally defined as the application of ecology to, and as ecological science, to agricultural systems. Agroecological methods draw on the ecological relationships among national, natural resources for agronomic practices. From a broader perspective, however, agroecology has three practical forms. Transdisciplinary knowledges, agricultural practices, and crucially, social movements. Their integration has provided a collective action mode for contesting the dominant agri-food regime and creating alternatives. So that gives us a, a reference point for evaluating the role of sustainable intensification and its relation to agroecology. Here, Brazil illustrates these three forms of agroecology, agricultural practices, these marches, social movements, and mobile fairs as transdisciplinary knowledge. And it also helps to draw on broader theories of innovation, or niche innovations, how they conform or transform the dominant system. It may have, innovation may have different empowerment strategies, either to fit and conform to the dominant regime or else to stretch and transform it. This is according to a paper by Smith and Raven in Research Policy. They say fit and conform empowerment makes the niche innovation more competitive with the mainstream socio-technical practices in otherwise unchanged selection environments, such as market competitive pressures. In innovation, it is originally perceived as pathbreaking becomes merely incremental in terms of its broader implications through this conform strategy. By contrast, in a stretch and transform empowerment, innovations aim to undermine the incumbent regime and transmit institutional reforms into restructured regimes. So they tr potentially transform the selection environments. In the case of agroecological methods, conform is illustrated by agroindustrial farmers appropriating some agroecological methods, or conversely, organic farmers becoming conventionalized. Transform is illustrated by counter-hegemonic food movements linking farmers and CSOs, explicitly challenging the dominant regime, especially through the concept of food sovereignty. Here are some examples of conform roles accommodating the dominant regime. Organic systems increasing reliance on biological inputs as functional substitutes for chemical inputs. Biological inputs becoming commoditized, organic farming being conventionalized. And even some companies appropriating some aspects of agroecological methods such as no-till conservation agriculture by, promoted by the Syngenta Foundation, and even more strangely, perhaps, uh, McDonald's. Agroecology strategy. This is from a French website, so it's Le Plan Eco Progrès pour l'environnement. Well, let's come back now to sustainable intensification. So as I mentioned before, mainstream institutions have appropriated this concept SI, to justify more efficient resource usage as environmentally sustainable. And just as an example of how the concept is taken up, 
people may know Copa Cojeca. It's the Europe-wide federation of farmers organizations, generally representing the more agro-industrial, intensive input type farmers, although it does have an organic section of its own. So according to this lobby, quote, to satisfy the demand for SI, it is essential to have better conditions for more efficient use of water, fertilizers, and other resources at farm level. So if it, the concept becomes assimilated to eco-efficiency, a long-standing concept about using resources more efficiently. <coughs> well, the sustainability aspects become larger. Now, there are many expert policy reports advocating various forms of SI as a toolkit incorporating agroecological methods with many other methods. These reports discuss trade-offs between productivity and other aims, such as biodiversity, ecosystem services, and so on. As a basis to seek agroecological methods which can minimize the trade-offs, or even go beyond the trade-offs towards synergies between these apparently conflicting aims. But this ideal is in, limited by generally equating productivity with the yield of specific commodity crops, in turn attributed to specific techniques, like a one-to-one -one correspondence. By contrast, an agroecosystem approach valorizes wider public goods, environmental goods, especially the wider biodiversity, partly to enhance agroecological methods themselves, based on farmers' knowledge exchange, itself a public good. But this approach seems to remain marginal in SI agendas in practice, even though they may appear in, in documents. So that's just my sense of the various themes that, and tensions that arise in many ex reports, expert reports that I've seen. And now I'll go into more detail into one that I find perhaps the most interesting because it's the most explicit and even graphic. So this is uh, a report from well, RISE, Rural Investment Support for Europe, which I think gained a high profile because of its uh, involvement the, the role of former EU commissioners, like Franz Fischler, who was the agriculture commissioner, uh, Janusz Potocznik, the former environment commissioner, and funding from various f foundations. So it, it is gaining a high profile. That's one reason to pay close attention. So according to this report, <clears throat> so sustainable intensification means simultaneously improving the productivity and environmental management of agricultural land. An SI path could mean an increase in per hectare of environmental services of the farm or of agricultural products. You needn't mean only the latter. So this implies a choice the priorities between raising yield in the conventional sense or else broader environmental goods. And it mentions nutrient recycling, but almost as an input substitution. It says an, an alternative approach is to consider changing the balance between livestock and crops within the locality so that the manure can be spread directly on the crops without treatment and specialized road transport more like a, a closed-loop system. What about trade-offs? Well, it says, generally, intensification involves some reduction in environmental performance, such as resource conservation, in exchange for increased food production, but still staying within the sustainable quadrant in the past, 
production choices have led to some sacrifice of environment for food output. And this idea of trade-offs is uh, more graphically illustrated here than I've seen anywhere else. So you've got this would be perhaps the, the familiar case where the more you try to increase yield, the less biodiversity, as indicated by the number of plant species, while conversely, the more you try to protect and enhance biodiversity, the lower the yield. Well, sustainable intensification is meant somehow to minimize, at least, that trade-off by staying in this quadrant, what they call it, of relatively high biodiversity, and somehow reconciling both biodiversity with yield by moving in this direction. Well, how to do that? There, there are um, a, a list of, I think, six. Yeah, I'm going back here, which I skipped. Six methods, including agroecology, biodynamic methods, organic, integrated, precision farming, and conservation, agriculture, all to be evaluated for their potential to somehow minimize the trade-offs and achieve all the aims at the same time. Another report, which may have special significance for this country, is the Land Use Policy Group. It's, it, this is also critically interesting because, you know, given the relatively marginal profile of agroecology in this country, let's say relative to France or Italy, UK state agencies commission agroecologists to produce a report on sustainable intensification. And they noted trade-offs of several kinds, especially being productivity versus greenhouse gas emissions. He said, productivity also implies efficiency with respect to resources used, which may involve a trade-off between yields per hectare, on, on the one hand, and fossil energy use and greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of food produced. They give a warning Using specific practices in isolation, it's like simply avoiding chemical fertilizers and pesticides, perhaps by substituting bio input, can have negative consequences in terms of crop production and yields. By contrast, combining suitable practices in a systemic way can mean that the potential for synergistic relationships can be exploited to gain greater benefits. For example, legumes fix nitrogen, but they also support pollinators and improve the nutritional health value of forage crops for livestock. They also give a warning about input substitution. As they say, It's the relying on input substitution. They say the um, sustainable intensification is focused mainly on producing more with less, that is, less external inputs, perhaps by input, represents only the first step on the way. You know, perhaps hopefully <laughs> implying that it will be a step on the way to more integrated agroecosystem approaches. But maybe that's wishful thinking. You can ask the step on the way to where is it a step towards maintaining and legitimizing intensive agricultural practices in the name of somewhat reducing the environmental harm from chemical inputs. So as a different approach, they advocate an agroecology perspective for a whole system redesign focused on the farm ecosystem rather than just input substitution. They say, 
fundamentally SI is knowledge based rather than technology intensive and that knowledge means knowledge exchange among farmers as well as with scientists, agronomists and so on. So this goes far beyond you know, input substitution um, from, say, from inputs which could be as functional substitutes of chemicals. Shown you that before. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Okay. Now, now we go back to a framing of intensification, which has some resemblance to the LUPG report. This goes back a little in time to te technology platform organics, whose origin I should explain. It was created partly in response to the emergence of these technology platforms <clears throat> based on agro-industry. There was one for plants, one for biofuels, one for food, and so on. All encouraged by, and even funded by, the European Commission in the early stages, like 2007, 2008. And especially around the new policy framework of the EU to promote a bioeconomy as the sustainable future. So Technology Platform Organics was set up to intervene in that EU research policy for a future bioeconomy by redefining it as agroecology, as a truly knowledge-based bioeconomy. So in its strategic research agenda, 2008, TP Organics elaborated, in particular, the concept eco-functional intensification, where functional denoted more efficient use of natural resources, nutrient recycling techniques, and agroecological methods for enhancing diversity and the health of soil, crops, and livestock. That summarizes the whole report in <laughs> one sentence. But moreover, see, horizontal integration between agriculture and energy production provides means to shorten organic cycles as well as to substitute for external inputs. And they say, diversified land use can open up new possibilities for combining food production with biomass production and on-farm production of renewable energy from livestock manure, small biotopes, perennial crops, and semi-natural non-cultivated areas. So they're promoting an integrated agroecosystem approach for maximizing the use of natural resources through farmers' collective knowledge. And they go on to say, as farmers add value through quality methods and products, shorter food chains help them to gain relatively more value vis-a-vis -vis the market intermediaries otherwise known as short food supply chains, so the poor and French, and so on. So they say, the empowerment of local economies will be an important trend in European agriculture and food production. This may be linked with regional food chains, complementary to addressing issues of fairness and efficiency in the globalization of food chains. And so this is a transformative perspective on linking the three main components of agroecology, as in the Wetzel 2009 paper, the scientific knowledge and agricultural practices, and the social movements, which were brought in to form the support base of technology platform organics and to advocate the policy changes which would favor these practices. Their concept has been taken up even in the Horizon 2020 work program without the word functional, just ecological intensification, but with the concept still there in the wording of the calls. So it, it has been an opportunity for consortia to implement, operationalize this perspective within research projects.
mean, in everything I've said about the relationship between SI and agroecology, there is a, a tricky methodological issue about the meaning of these terms, because they both formalize or, or name something which has a far broader existence than the name. Most agroecological practices are not called such explicitly. And likewise, you know, sustainable intensification is naming a tendency which exists independently of the name. The name attempts to codify and promote that particular, particular version according to one's own perspective. And from that you know, methodological standpoint, I have a sense that these issues, these tensions between SI and agroecology were also arising in the greening of the common agricultural policy. So just to, to step back a bit in time, in European agriculture has had a long history of conflicts over what should be its future. In, in one tendency, intensifying cultivation methods for greater yield and global economic competitiveness. And that's been pr promoted either as a way to reduce or even eliminate the subsidy, or to, to redirect the subsidy towards more productive methods Say from the standpoint of again, culture, uh, Copa Cojeca, the main agro industry farm model, or alternatively, extensifying agricultural methods through lower external inputs, and higher knowledge, and internal resource inputs for higher quality products and biodiversity conservation. So the latter perspective clearly draws on agroecological methods. So despite the global pressures for trade liberalization, European Union maintains significant subsidy, aiding agricultural production under the broad concept multifunctionality. The, the cap is dominated, the common agricultural policy is dominated by a, what uh, has been theorized as a neo-mercantilist, techno-modernist agenda, this is according to uh, paper which Mark was a co-author. This agenda seeks a competitive advantage for commodity export, and to, to do so still depends on the cap <coughs> pillar one, also known as single foreign payments, e even as it becomes officially delinked from productivity levels, it still remains essential for the, these uh, in intensive input farms to, be, to continue their economic viability. At the same time, there are pressures to become more market-oriented in, in a different way through quality products and agroecological methods aimed at more affluent consumers. So there are tensions between those trajectories continuing to pervade the, the cap and its criteria for subsidy. And I think we can see these tensions as implicitly illustrating the tensions of sustainable intensification, especially now in the post-2013 cap. In the run-up to the, uh, all the, the final legislation setting the criteria from 2013 onwards, numerous civil society organizations and farmers groups formed <coughs> a grand coalition, ARC 2020, Agriculture and Rural Convention, because the, the new cap was going to run until 2020. So it brought together diverse perspectives and agendas, which all had in common that they wanted something different than the dominant agenda of uh, just making agro-industry a little less environmentally harmful. They wanted more publicly beneficial alternatives. So resulting from their campaign, the CAP regulations mandated measures for greening agriculture. So when the CAP's first pillar, now renamed Green Direct Payments, 
These must comprise at least 30% of the national budget for direct farm payments. And farmers can be remunerated for three obligatory practices, maintenance of permanent grassland, ecological focus areas, and crop diversification. For each farm larger than 15 hectares of arable land, 5% must be covered by ecological focus areas. These are meant to bring environmental benefits, improve biodiversity, and maintain attractive landscapes, such as by landscape features, buffer strips, forested areas, fallow land, areas with nitrogen fixing crops, and so on. So all this was seen as a, a big improvement by our 2020, except that there had been heavy lobbying by the agro-industry lobby, Coca Cogeca, which successfully influenced the European Parliament, especially the uh, European People's Party, representing the, the, the right-wing Christian Democratic parties, to weaken the requirements. So as a result, the ecological focus areas have flexible criteria, allowing member states and farmers to bypass or even contradict the aim to enhance biodiversity. As it turned out, according to one analysis that I found, some member states have favored the more productive options, that is, allowing farmers to use only these options, such as catch crops and nitrogen fixing crops, thus facilitating in more intensive cultivation methods, perhaps instead of chemical fertilizers, or even in addition to chemical fertilizers. And it's still eligible for, for the subsidy. Moreover, farmers can plow up semi-natural grass now, which is an important site for biodiversity. In, in response to these um, developments, priorities, the uh, NGO coalition published a guide for how their national affiliates would try to influence implementation of the, the greening criteria. It said, the new cap can help to transition EU agriculture towards agroecological approaches, but this aim conflicts with the the EU's efforts at, quote, promoting and incentivizing factory-style agriculture based on models of sustainable intensification or by simplifying the system at the expense of agroecological outcomes. So see, they're explicitly denouncing at least the form of sustainable intensification, which is informing the priorities for the production, productive options at the expense of the biodiversity aims, which are written into the uh, greening criteria. So in, in these ways, the greening measures have been selectively incentivizing some agroecological methods for greater yield with lower input costs for farmers. So I think these can be seen as at least an implicit form of sustainable intensification serving productivist aims, even the neo-mercantilist agenda that is still increasing productivity to compete better on global markets while avoiding some of the criticism for environmental harm. This agenda is being contested by the coalition of various NGOs and farmers groups. So they best support us to lobby national and regional governments for criteria favoring agroecological practices, especially biodiversity. Now, the cap is just one area of struggle around these issues. There are many other EU rules which effectively promote monocultures and reduce biodiversity in the area around as well as inside farms. Biodiversity is undermined by EU seed regulations and intellectual property rights, which induce genetic uniformity in crop monocultures and livestock production. They also restrict farmers' free exchange of, of seeds and livestock. 
the rules impede agroecological innovations based on functional diversity. The new legislation that was proposed a, a couple of years ago would impose a conformity to a standardized agro-industrial model. In response, European action networks demanded changes in those rules along these lines. Farmers' rights to resow save seeds, the right to free exchange and disseminate their seeds and livestock breeds, the right to access any of their seeds and livestock embryos stored in gene banks, and the right to protect their seeds from biopiracy, meaning intellectual property rights. So this illustrates the broader legislative framework which undermines the uh, laudable aims of the greening measures to promote biodiversity. So move to conclusions for my summary. So since the term was coined, at least as far as I know, by Jules sustainable intensification was later extended to global relevance by mainstream institutions, including FAO. This around uh, 2007, this indicated a shift towards a neo-productivist paradigm as well as a nascent corporate environmental food regime. The SI agenda means to address multiple problems, including food insecurity, environmental degradation, and climate change, somehow within the dominant assumptions about farmers competing on global markets through higher productivity. The, the old question around sustainable agriculture, what to sustain, has been somewhat displaced by the question, what and how to intensify it. In, in a sense, it makes the complex perhaps even more stark than they were before. But these, these multiple aims cannot easily be reconciled. Expert risk reports discuss the trade-offs between productivity and other aims as a basis to seek agroecological methods which can minimize such trade-offs. But this aim is limited by equating productivity with the yield of specific commodity crops in turn, you know, attributed to specific techniques which are meant to be evaluated separately, I mean, thereby undermining the uh, whole system, uh, well, agroecosystem approach, which is uh, the basis of agroecology as a transformative agenda. And analogous tensions around the meaning of SI arise in the post-2013 cap, the greening measures. The, by contrast, the agroecosystem approach valorizes biodiversity, both within and outside agriculture. But it seems to be marginal to SI in practice, regardless of whether it's called SI. And on that, I just give you a, a quote that I meant to include before. From, this is in response to, to the Land Use Policy Group report that I showed you before. That, uh, according to Tom McMillan of the Soil Association, who took part in the workshop, that the, the concept seems broad enough to encompass agroecology. But whenever he's seen the concept operationalized in a, in a specific agenda, it seems to be mainly about increasing productivity, just with less chemical inputs than before. So referring back to the Wetzel framework on the three components of agroecology, the prevalence initiatives for SI selectively appropriate the two components, the scientific ecological knowledge and agronomic practices, albeit as, as techniques being transferred to farmers or even transferred from the north to the global south. By contrast, the concept eco-function intensification from technology platform organics emphasizes biodiversity functions. 
we've been in beyond agriculture. Such methods to be remunerated through for short food supply chains, thus building different markets. This depends on civil society movements, promoting the necessary policy chains, and building popular support. So those two different approaches involve different empowerment strategies for agroecological methods, either conforming to the dominant system or transforming it. And this, this little table has the, the three rows based on the Smith and Raven paper that I mentioned before, the three arenas or aspects where these empowerment strategies differ. You can just look at it. So in some, SI may seem yet another example of conventional agriculture's capacity to sustain the unsustainable, as Fred Buttle sarcastically referred to the uh, biotechnology agenda a decade ago. Yet, these initiatives may offer opportunities for CSO farmer alliances to press for agroecosystem approaches linked with solidarity markets. Such opportunities will depend on critically analyzing the endemic tensions around SI in specific contexts. I'll finish there. particular, these coalitions that have been promoting food sovereignty as a different perspective, say, than food security. I didn't take time to explain that, but I mean, food security is, is really an ideology of productivist agro-food systems, whereby the, the problem is supposedly insufficient food, which now isn't the case at all. It's the wrong kind of food produced in the wrong way in the wrong places and so on. Wrong land use. So, food sovereignty is, is uh, a slogan for involving civil society in decisions on what should be produced and how and where. In particular, for the, to try to enhance the self sufficiency of regions to produce their food in an environmentally sustainable way. And that means changing the whole framework, in particular, ch changing the control, taking away the control from the, the dominant actors 
who, who now basically run the food system and in the corporate food regime. So those are just some general general strategic points. But how to do that, you know, it depends on you know, civil society movements linked with those farmers groups which want to make these changes. For example, you know, ARC 2020 is the broadest coalition, and then there are more specific groups promoting food sovereignty linked with agroecology, such as the uh, European Coordination of the Encantasina, which is part of that coalition. Are you optimistic about that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been a long time since I ever thought of myself as being either optimistic or pessimistic. It doesn't really help. What helps is to identify the potential for improvement and, and the, the warnings against being incorporated, the, the warnings against uh, the appropriation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I, my, my, I think you've had a very interesting talk. I think you managed to you know, explain the whole world thing in, <laughs> in, a short, in a short presentation or so, especially the thinking on the European level. Uh, what, I, what, what I wanted to comment on is the, um, the, the social, sustainable intensification in the, in the first instance. Um, have you also analyzed how you know how that is actually physically possible? You know, there is critique from from degrowth movement on sustainable um, uh, development um, as such. So where where you actually have you know some of those terms can actually not even work if, if you really think it's true. Uh, sustainable intensification. Maybe a similar term, you know, it's, it's brought up as a policy, as a strategy. But you, if you really analyze it, how, how it can actually work, it, it can't really work. Intensification and sustainability can cannot be combined. Um, so there is work work on that one. Instead of just you know f assuming that that this strategy is one which can be done anyway. Um, yeah. Well, let's say is, I mean, whether or not it works depends on how one defines the sustainability and the intensification aspects. Mm -hmm. And that's why I found that uh, RISE report so interesting, because it, it has this table with the, uh, yeah. the trade-offs or potential synergies. So where are these synergies? But they exist if one defines the product more broadly as biodiversity, as a biodiverse environment, public goods, for farmers' empowerment, and so on. You know, irreducible to the quantity of a particular commodity. Mm -hmm. but, but again, you know, just come, adding to that, when I see this very simplified, see, it, it misses the real big point about uh, the pollution uh, which is currently uh, attached to yields and higher yields. So the kind of, you know, sustain, you know, agriculture is very productive in terms of pollution. Uh, we have a new colleague who came from Australia uh, and he talked about um, uh, uh, the things, he, he's a, he worked in fish in, on the Great Barrier Reef and, he, and they analyzed uh, mutations in fish in the, in the big ocean and they could place it very clearly back to, um, uh, it was sugar beet and certain pesticides they're using, and nobody wanted to believe them. You know, he gave that talk, uh, and then they, realized, they, 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 they found that the industry had changed a certain pesticide. They, they could find that in the sea, and, and then the industry started to believe them because no one had this knowledge. You need to substitute a sub substitute a in the pesticide. To substitute a biopesticide. No, they both had different pesticides. Oh. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that those things, it's not only about the, a little river or so, it, we are talking about the whole ocean. Those things are building up very slowly and, and we can measure them. 
and 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 those you know if you would ask this production system to remove all those pesticides from the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, uh, they would have you know it would cost them millions, or it is actually not possible anyway. So it's just because because the, the Pacific Ocean is still big enough to to make that dilution. Uh, it, it, that's how it works, you know. But eventually, the Pacific Ocean is also limited, you know. Anyway, I, I think that was just an example on 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 how how they always frame that and, and ignore all the the the, the, the this, this other things. You know. The sustainable intensification seems to assume there is no problem with with the, the current production system. It seems. You know, as, as it would be fine, we just need to intensify it a little bit. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that all these reports mention the chemical inputs as a problem, mm -hmm. in, in many senses, of the problem as, well, as intensive in cost for farmers as in the cost price squeeze, as intensive in resources to produce them. As a, as a burden on the global environment, and then on the pollution effects. Mm -hmm. I think they all acknowledge that, but then they're looking for ways to overcome the dependence on the, those chemical inputs, uh, especially through bio inputs. So that is the aim. Mm -hmm. it, it is there, but then the bio inputs then seem to be attractive as a fix, mm. as a way to keep the system otherwise the same as before, mm. with the same aims as before. And sometimes that's even called an ecosystem approach. Mm. Yeah, it, and, and it means evaluating yeah, each yeah. input or input substitute mm. in its own terms. Sometimes one of the reports says it's difficult to evaluate mm. these uh, separately. Well, of course it is, because it all depends on the interactions. Mm -hmm. But from an agro-ecosystem approach, in, in the full sense of the word, then it needs rethinking the whole, whole basis of productivity. What is the aim to produce and how? Not just input substitution. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent and very succinct sort of, you know, you captured the whole Transformation and you know, conformity sort of uh, issues we decide. But just comment, really. I was just thinking you summarized this whole thing with this one sentence towards the end when you said that they assume that uh, they'll be able to, it's okay, you know, productive is the agenda in, in any case, they'll be able to compete in the global market. Right? So, one major critic could be I was thinking this is, this is another new level ploy of differential rent extraction perhaps you know it's a kind of uh, and it's, it's based on greed and they, it, it, it kind of flip flop it, they can again switch back to you know putting in some of fertilizers or pesticides alongside this and this is this exclusive. So, because it's based on the future rent extraction, it excludes others who cannot, you know, get into that race or putting in that extra bed which the rich or the mightier ones can. So, it's essentially exclusive in that sense too. So, in, so it, it is not, you know, so it, that request to be transformed and that neoliberal sort of larger policy and as uh, Ulrich said, it actually also highlights the second contradiction, etc. Right, so this externalities so this production and production sort of uh, contradiction in the capitalist production system. So, it, so it basically highlights that you know uh, I quite agree with you that we are looking at a transformation, and there's a different league, uh, different battle altogether. Right? It's not just very compartmentalized, just food. Or agroecological solution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your really interesting presentation. Uh, it's I don't know if my question or comment will be really clear. It's more like a philosophical thought. 
It's just that you know you have the dialectic of transforming and conforming and dominant system and alternative system. And I always think personally uh, that we have to see it as a dialogue or a process, always moving like a yin and yang stuff. You always have a dominant model and you will always need counter powers. And recently I read in a prospective report uh, for the European Union that they wanted, in this report, they wanted to make agroecology the new dominant social technique model. So I was really scared about that because it's many facts we want to reproduce this whole idea of dominance again. We want to make another system, an alternative system, to the dominant one. And when agroecology, if one day agroecology becomes the dominant system, I hope there will be other alternative to it. So, and if agroecology is the dominant system, it would be nice to conform to it, but it would be also nice to transform it. So there is always this need for me to have conforming and transforming as this yin yang process in dialogue. So I think it's not the thing is not to focus on transforming, but maybe more to to to, to understand the whole dialogue as a process. Uh, I'm curious, was this report in France or where is this report? Uh, well, it was written by uh, French people. Yes, uh, I can send it to you. It's still on the press. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like a. Uh, European Union perspective for mainstreaming a work or something like that. Yeah. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, I have been following the French case because it's the most interesting. And if I had more time, I would have said something about France. But some of you here may know that I think it was 2013, the French agriculture minister, Stéphane Le Foll, said, we will make France the European leader for agroecology. And they invested a lot of money in, in the research system, um, extension services, training farmers in agroecological techniques. That they, just in case this came up, I, uh, oh. Yeah, they have uh, 12 principles of agroecology, which they disseminate widely. And this overlaps somewhat with the research agenda of INRA, the main international network of agricultural research institutes, also promoting agroecology pretty much along the lines of sustainable intensification, or what they call their ecological intensification. And this is this can be very confusing, especially to me. <laughs> Until it was explained to me that the people promoting agroecology as a transformative agenda rarely call it agroecology. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They do say participatory plant breeding with farmers, mm -hmm. agroecosystem development. They use those terms mm -hmm. and really do work with paysan mm -hmm. to enhance the paysan savoir faire. So that, that tension between the different meanings of agroecology, say, in relation to education, becomes more obvious in France than anywhere else, because you have these publicly promoted agendas. And in fact, it was a network of all the grassroots farmers' organization the year when the French ministry uh, said we want to put uh, agroecology on the agenda, they created what they call peasant agroecology in reaction to yes. mainstream agroecology. So now in France you have the ministry, and they call it now ministry, French ministry of agroecology, they really call it uh, agroecology du ministère, ministry of agroecology, and peasant agroecology. So yeah, it's really funny. Yes. Yeah. 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 So now they're overtly distinguishing different versions or types of agroecology. Yeah, according to one critical, well, this is from the Confederation Paysan, criticizing the ministry's plan. It says it lacks territorial approaches, that is, ways of linking agroecosystem development with overall environmental and economic development. It is based on assumptions about techniques 
which need no place for savoir faire of his own. That's the original French. The large scale reform holdings is not questioned, although its implications for environment are well known. And then, according to uh, a critical analysis, which I found, there is a concern that the label agroecological would end up being overused indiscriminately in much the same way as the term greening was applied to the cat. At the same time, some of the activists around our 2020, based in France, see an opportunity to promote their version of agroecology through networks of farmers which are being funded by the agriculture ministry. They're called, well, in, uh, Groupement d'intérêt économique et environnemental, economic and environmental interest groups, based in farmers. So that, that would be the most interesting place to study the, the contradictions and how activists with a clear strategy try to intervene and use the available resources mm -hmm. for a transformative version of agroecology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One, one last question for Kjell. Yeah. Well, yeah. Should we go? Yes. Yeah. Uh, more than a question is, is a comment. Um, it, it is fantastic, this overview, and it's really informative. Uh, maybe you could also expand into how sustainable intensification is used into the urban agriculture literature, which is where I first came across with the, with the term, where I think, I guess, means producing where there is no production, which is a way of intensifying, if you want, but it's completely decontextualized, but then you get assumed, in many cases, as an approach. So. Uh, is basically another area of neoliberal appropriation and enclosure. And, uh, and that's very interesting, especially in a in around urban design, uh, landscape design, where it is assumed as, as the model. But maybe without with different meanings or in a very vague way, but it's mm -hmm. interesting, especially because in, it's an expanding area, where there is no background knowledge on farming practices. Mm -hmm. But that's the terminology get get um, used quite often. You mean SI? I think so. Yeah. That's in urban agriculture. In urban agriculture. In urban agriculture. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't find it. Mm -hmm. And what was your question? Yeah, some of the. There's an idea of retrofitting, basically. In terms of industrial farming. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was just. Um, Surprised that a lot of it, the talk was. Um, well, you did mention some um, uh, trading mechanisms and how food gets um, uh, in the short supply chains, uh, but I was surprised that it, it was uh, mainly focused on production. Um, so I'm just thinking about the term local, which no one seems to uh, um, agree on what it means, but and, and on alternative food networks. And you could see that in those networks, people could trade um, produce that is comes from uh, techniques that uh, productive techniques that are not necessarily organic. Um, or you could have very conventional um, um, food chains that trade organic produce. So I I I feel that. Um, yeah, perhaps a, a, another layer to this is the trading side of what what it means in sustainable intensification and and and, and what it means in agroecological terms because I, I still haven't quite understood that. Yes, yeah, because I didn't take much time to get my views, but uh, there's a connection between these two because. The, they're both potentially about markets and how the production relates to other dominant markets or tries to create different kinds of markets, which I call solidarity markets for sure. And in the case of urban agriculture, I mean, this is news to me that sustainable intensification is being explicitly discussed. 
Of course, similar issues. But used, used. Used, or the, I mean, the methods are being used. But whether they're used, and I can see, I mean, this would be a, a, perhaps a, an issue for agriculture anywhere. In what sense to intensify, for what purposes. But as far as I know, urban agriculture rarely <coughs> attempts to compete on a larger geographical market for low price. It has quite different aims. So that may protect it somewhat from the what we call the neo-productivist paradigm rooted in <coughs> global market competitiveness. Mm. Maybe. 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 But it still has similar tensions, but perhaps without that that fundamental driver for, for global market competitiveness. And in that regard, for your question, why is uh, your, your local expert here on uh, alternative agri-food networks or food localization and so on? But it means, in, in general terms, markets created for the purpose of promoting locally grown food and or food that was produced with environmentally better methods. Now, of course, the organic is the obvious one, but that's a, a legally constituted classification, which then is transportable, enforceable by law and so on, recognizable. The more but what we're talking about here in grand agroecology is a much broader range of techniques and production methods beyond organic agriculture, but still with much greater potential for improvement than just the organic certified market, which is inherently limited by consumers' ability or willingness to pay much more for the food. So just one example would be uh, community-supported agriculture through box schemes, which may be organic initially, but then expand often to include other producers, which may not be certified organic, but use environmentally better methods. And then there's participatory guarantee systems, uh, which originated in the Global South and now are being promoted by IFOM EU to promote or to create you know, markets for farms which are improving their in environmental practices, methods which cause less environmental harm through the spread of knowledge among the farmers and, and, the and so on, in order to reward them for improvements you know, short of organic certification. So these are just you know, some examples of how a, a transformative agenda around agroecology creates solidarity markets. And so protects these better methods from the competitive pressures coming from supermarkets. Okay, just one final question, and then I think we better yeah. we carry on a discussion yeah. uh, in the kitchen. Lopa, would you yeah. just quickly? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I was interested in the fact that what is common to both. Obviously, the entire discussion, we have framed it in terms of production, market, productivity. It's common to both. Uh, you might be uh, have different views regarding which is more productivity. And it's all in terms of the productivist agenda, both in different ways. It depends on what inputs you use here and what inputs are used in the other system. But going beyond this intensification lens or productivity lens, there's another aspect on which I think they clearly not talk much talk is there, but which is clearly gaining importance is in terms of resilience. That with how, in terms of changes in climate change and how these type of systems have different outcomes. So whether it's whether these type of farming systems and how they are geared towards adapting uh, to climate change and other risk factors in production, and in this they clearly vary. So whether the discussion should be more around in terms of uh, alternate concepts which go beyond sustainability? 
Yes, well, resilience is probably you know, becoming um, the most um, prominent buzzword on um, displacing or redefining sustainability. Because it applies now to all systems. Yeah. Um, energy, water, or anything, you know, security. And in the case of, of agriculture, then it has contested meanings, because it can mean making the agro-industrial system more resilient. <laughs> yeah, so it can continue basically as before, or it can mean a system redesign around agroecological methods so that it is less vulnerable yes, in terms to the shocks of yeah. environmental stresses mm -hmm. and perhaps global market stresses. So, and that, that, that is linked with food sovereignty towards localized or regionalized systems of making production consumption. So I, I agree that that needs attention as well and is, is contested just as is sustainable intensification. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Okay, thanks for all your